I'm reading Luke chapter 17, verse 11 in my Bible. It's page 1051. Jesus heals 10 men with leprosy. Now, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, 10 men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, Were not all ten men cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. Good morning, St. Mike's. It's great to be with you, all of those in the building without masks, hurrah. And those of you joining us online, uh, it's great to be with you. Um, I thought it'd be great this morning to ask three questions and then I'll pray and we'll take communion. How does that sound? So you're sitting comfortably. The first question I want to ask is this. Do you have favourites amongst your children? (laughs) Now I know I should not be asking that question, particularly from this privileged position. Uh, I get into trouble for a number of reasons in our home. And one of them is I always say to my children, you're my favourite. And they always say to me, Daddy, you can't say that. What about the other two? Because we've got three. uh, Joseph, 17, Matilda, 15, and Reuben, 12. And uh, I say, yes, but but Joseph, you're my favorite eldest. And Matilda, you're my favorite daughter. And Reuben, you're my favorite little one. And uh, and so I rescue it pretty quick. Um, But but actually, it's really difficult not to have favorites, isn't it? And as, as good, responsible parents, of course, we don't have favorites. Either that or all of our children are our favourites. Isn't that right? Now, as we read the Bible, there are four pictures we get of the life of Jesus. And these four perspectives from Matthew, Mark, Luke and John all have different perspectives on his life. And each gospel has favourites. Did you know that? Each gospel, Jesus is portrayed as having particular favourites. For example, the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John is a little bit different than the other three gospels. Um, But in the Gospel of John, it talks about somebody called the beloved disciple. You heard about the beloved disciple. Um, Six times in the Gospel of John, it refers to the beloved disciple. The Gospel of John. Guess how many times that person mentioned in Matthew, zero. Mark, zero. Luke, zero. I wonder who the beloved disciple might have been. I wonder if there's a little bit of editorial emphasis being added. And, and, and this morning I want to focus particularly on the Gospel of Luke. And Luke had favorites. Luke was the author both of the Gospel and of the Acts of the Apostles, and he had favorites. Luke's favorite were the poor. You see, the poor are only mentioned five times in Matthew, five times in Mark, but they're mentioned ten times in the Gospel of Luke. And Luke goes to great emphasis also to challenge wealth in the Gospel of John. You know, in the Gospel of Luke, it says, uh, blessed are the poor. In Matthew, uh, in Matthew blessed are the poor in spirit. <laughs> in Luke, it says, uh, preach good news to the poor. In Luke, it tells the story of the the widow who comes and puts two coins in the offering. In Luke, it talks about how difficult it is for a rich person to get into heaven, harder than going through the eye of a needle. So in Luke, clearly, he has this favoritism, this bias, this emphasis, might be um, a more acceptable word, for the poor. So the second question I want to ask this morning 
is this. Why is Jesus good news for the poor? Why is Jesus good news for the poor? And thank you, Jay, for the reading uh, from Luke 17, verse 11 onwards. We have this story of Jesus encountering the poor. When you think poor, don't just think financially poor, although that is often the case. Think disadvantaged. Now, Jesus was roaming through uh, Israel, and as he approached a village, he met ten lepers. And their encounter with him was transformational. Their lives were completely transformed as a result. And I'd like to talk about three ways that their lives were changed as a result of hearing Jesus. Because by encountering Jesus, these lepers, this community of ten lepers, experienced social inclusion. You see, in those days, if you had leprosy, you were an outcast. You were declared unclean, not by the doctors, but by the priests. The priest declared you unclean and you were sent to live away from everybody else. You were forced to live in a ghetto, in a township, on the edge of the village. So as Jesus approached the visit village, who were the first people he met? Not the villagers in the village, but the lepers on the outside of the village. And you weren't allowed to approach lepers when they'd become outcasts. And so they stood at a distance from Jesus because they weren't allowed to approach people. And said, Jesus, have mercy on us, have pity on us. And as they went to the priests, they were healed. This was a massive encounter experience of social inclusion. These lepers who'd been forced to live away from everybody else were suddenly cleansed. Now, I love the part in the story where it reports that only one leper returned to thank Jesus. Now, I have a theory. It's not there in the text, but I have a theory, you see. Because these ten lepers, the Bible doesn't tell us how long they've been separated from their families, from their wife and children. Weeks, months, years? So I can imagine what those people might have gone to do in the moment they were cleansed. Now, I travel a little bit. And uh, my kids are a little bit more grown up now, but when they're a little bit younger, I have to say that's in case they're watching. Uh, they're, when they're a little bit younger, when I get home from a trip, I'd open the front door and I'd hear these cries, Daddy! And they'd run down the hallway and uh, little Reuben would fly into the air, launch himself and grab me and Matilda would come and give me a little cuddle around my middle and, uh, and then my oldest son, Joseph, would come along and just knock my shoulder. Good to see you, Dad. You know, they're always special moments, aren't they, when you return from being separated. Now, I rather suspect that only one out of the ten came back to thank Jesus because the other nine were desperate to run home and hug their kids and hug their wives. Because it's an awful thing to feel separated and all alone in the world. But when we encounter Jesus, we encounter connectedness. We encounter community. We encounter love. We encounter inclusion. I was sat on a bus just before Christmas coming back into Wimbledon, and I started chatting to a, a lady sat next to me, an elderly lady, and I foolishly, or maybe, uh, let's call it foolish, I foolishly said to her, what are you doing, for, are you looking forward to Christmas? And she said, no. In that moment, I knew why she wasn't looking forward to Christmas. Because in the United Kingdom alone, 500,000 elderly people spend Christmas Day alone. And I say that to say there is a lot of loneliness in our communities. But not just elderly people alone at Christmas, but I've sat in this room, I've sat in this church, which I love, and I felt all alone. Because I haven't got the courage to go and talk to somebody, or somebody doesn't come to talk to me. You can be in a marriage and feel all alone in the world. Being around people doesn't mean you don't feel lonely. But Jesus, Jesus encounters us and loves us and includes us. My friends, this is good news for the poor and disadvantaged. It's good news for us. 
The second thing this community of lepers experienced from Jesus wasn't just social inclusion, but they experienced economic empowerment. You see, these men living on the outskirts of the village had no food. In fact, their families would have been struggling because they were probably the main provider for their families. So their families were hungry, they were hungry. They were living off of scraps left by others in the rubbish outside the village. So when Jesus cleansed them from their leprosy, it was an act of economic empowerment. Because now they could return to work. Now they could go back out to the fields and plant seed and grow stuff. Now they could go to market and sell it. Now they could go back to their workshops and make what they made and go to market and sell it. They were economically empowered. You see, in the New Testament, every encounter with Jesus where somebody's healed, remember, every one of those miracles of healing is also an act of economic empowerment. There was no welfare state in Israel at that time, there was no welfare system. Oh, well, here's an allowance if you've not got a job. That didn't exist. So if you had no work, you were begging for a living. I love the story in the book of Acts. You know, as Luke continues his story. And uh, Peter and James are sat, in, sat by the gate called Beautiful. And, oh, no, they're going through the gate called Beautiful. And they see a beggar. And he asks them for money. And they say, oh, Gold or silver, we haven't got. But what we have, be healed in Jesus' name. He got something better than gold or silver. He got back the ability to work again, to provide for himself, to provide for his family, and provide for other people. Every healing of Jesus in the New Testament, every healing is an act of economic empowerment. Giving people not only the ability to work again, but the dignity to work. Again, this is good news for the poor. And the third dimension for me in this story, social inclusion, economic empowerment, is political justice. You see, what sort of society, we ask ourselves, would diagnose somebody with a terminal illness and then force them to leave their families and live on a ghetto outside of their village, town or city. What sort of society? What sort of society would leave somebody struggling and in pain and not being allowed to be helped on the Sabbath? What sort of society would allow a woman caught in adultery to be taken out of the front door, to be put on the ground and about to be stoned to death? What sort of society? Incidentally, she was caught in adultery. Where was the man? I presume he just slipped out the back door. We have to challenge the injustices in our society, the wrongs in our society. And political injustice, yes, but also cultural injustice. You see, Jesus was challenging the political norms of his day. Politics is simply how we choose to live together. And Jesus was challenging everything about how society lived together, about the practices or non-practices of the Sabbath, how we treated people caught in adultery, how, how lepers were treated, how, how people have been married several times were treated. You read through the New Testament, it's full of it. And Jesus was challenging those injustices, not just within the political system, but even more powerfully within the culture. I've just returned to, from Berlin, and every time I go to Berlin, I love to visit the Berlin Wall and, and touch it and look both sides. But even though the wall is gone, there is still an economic division between the East and the West in Germany. Because removing a wall doesn't bring justice straight away. Next week, I go to South Africa. Thank goodness, apartheid, political apartheid is finished. But I tell you what, cultural apartheid is as strong as ever in South Africa and Jesus wherever he is present through his people challenges political and cultural injustice this is good news for the poor isn't it this is good news for the poor because encountering Jesus gives us an experience of heaven on earth while we're alive. Not just the promise of heaven when we die. This isn't some great escape religion called Christianity. 
that says to the poor, oh, it's okay, you'll be with Jesus one day. We'll all be together with Jesus one day and you won't be poor anymore. That's not good news. It's religious uh, nonsense. Sorry, I need to say something. I should trim then. It's religious nonsense. Actually, the message of the kingdom of God is here. It's now. There is the opportunity for us all to experience transformation through Jesus Christ in the here and in the now. It's incredible, isn't it? So yes, the gospel of Jesus Christ is about the forgiveness of sins. But if that's all it's about, all we're offering people is eternal life when they die. Whereas the gospel of the Bible talks about an eternal life that begins today, a fullness of life that begins today, a new reality, heaven on earth. So the third question I want to ask you as I come into land is this. Why or what have we got in common with Luke? Luke is this author of the gospel who's a little bit, he's got favorites. He's favored the, the poor. That's how he portrays Jesus. What have we got in common with him? Well, I would argue we've got quite a lot in common with Luke because Luke, Luke was a highly educated person. Luke was a, a professional person. He was a doctor. He was a physician. He was a highly resourceful person. And probably most of us here, not all of us, but most of us here are probably in the top quartile of qualified people in the world. Most of us here have got pr professional jobs, I suspect. And so actually we have quite a lot in common with Dr. Luke, if you want to call him that. We're like him, he's like us. We're highly qualified, we've got professional jobs, we're resourceful. So we've seen what, what Luke's response was to the poor. And this morning I want to ask us, in our position of privilege, what is our response to the poor? And I can tell you what the easiest response is. The easiest response is, to give some money. And uh, it's a good response, but it's the easiest response. And I hope you all do that. Give to St. Mike's because we do loads to help our community. But that is the easiest thing to do, to write a check, to make a bank transfer, to, to do however you do it. It's the easiest thing. It's the easiest, the quickest, and the least painful thing to do. The most sacrificial thing we can do is actually get involved as Jesus got involved with that community of lepers he spoke to them when nobody else would speak to them he touched them when nobody else would touch them he loved them and brought healing into their lives when nobody else would and this is the opportunity that we have yes give some more money please but it's easy. The most costly thing that we can do is just like Jesus embraced the poor, we can embrace the poor. And uh, I, I, we, our family loves St. Mike's. There's two things we really love amongst lots of, well, several, I won't go to a list, but we love the youth and children's work here. We love the leadership here, but also what we love here is this church's commitment to the community to serve the poor and serve the disadvantages, disadvantaged. This church is not a private members club where we pay our giving each week and we expect certain benefits back. It's not that. This church is arms, sleeves rolled up, jumping in, helping people. It's amazing. But what this church needs to continue doing that is people who give something of themselves to people in this community. And there are loads of opportunities at St. Mike's to give a little bit of time. And so I'd like to do something really practical and tangible this morning. Can you reach for your phones? And if you're online, you can do the same. And uh, I'd like to invite you to do something. I'd like you to consider 
would you give one hour? Would you give one hour? Would you give one hour a day? Well, actually, Matt, I can't at the moment. Would you give one hour a week? Hmm, possibly. Could you give one hour a fortnight or even one hour a month more than you're currently giving to serve this community through the work that St. Mike's already does? So it's a very simple question with a very simple answer. It's yes or no. Um, if the answer is yes, there's something that's going to come up on the screen. As if, oh, <laughs> over there. You see, in text, if you text one hour to that mobile number, um, now just so you know that this isn't contractual, there are no terms and conditions attached, uh, you're not signing away your life, all you're saying by texting one hour to this number is saying, I'm interested. So if you're at home, please, you're included. If you think you might be able to give an hour, a day, a week, a fortnight, a month, to help in this church serve the community more, could you just text one hour to that number? And then someone from the team will be in contact with you to talk about some options and ways you could get involved. Uh, not about your money, you can do that anyway, that's easy. This is about getting involved, about rolling up your sleeves, about, about serving, about giving. Because Jesus is good news for the poor. Let's stand.